Good morning, early birds. How are you? Hold on. Let me get, yep. Trying to get things organized. It's not the way I want to be sitting. I'm going to be sitting like this and like this. How are you? Happy Tuesday. Thank you for joining me here in the classroom. I'm the teacher. And I have to go get our book because today is book day. Today is reading day. I hope, I think it works out well. I like doing a variety of things. So even though we didn't finish our story and it was a long time since we were there with our story, uh, if you lived with the Cherokee, right? It was, it, was, it was a whole week ago since we've started our story. But it doesn't really matter because, it, like I said, a lot of times what that does is it gives us some really good reminders about what we're talking about and what we're doing. I need to go get the book and a couple other things. I got here on time, pretty much on time. So uh, I was here. I was opening up everything on time. And I have a horrible signal. Of course I have a horrible signal. Lucy, sit over here. Sit down. Lucy, sit right here. Otherwise, you're going to go inside. I put her basket down here now for her. Look, I'll show you. And so now she's sitting outside and she's so good because she just, she's still staying right here on the porch. But there's her little basket. It, there she is. There's little Lucy. There's her little basket that I brought out here. And yesterday she sat on the porch with me all day long. She just sat there while the workers were over here working. I left the door open. She could go in or out if she wants to. While the workers are over here working right? I'm building the new house. Watch the mysteries. It's not a big deal, but it's kind of a cool deal. I wish I would have, uh, I was going to start our uh, early bird classroom today upstairs so you could see that whole thing. Maybe I'll finish it upstairs. I don't know. We'll see. Or maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just probably show you tomorrow because tomorrow's our science and math day. And then on Thursday, we have our phonics day. All right. So let me go get you the Cherokee book, because I did not bring the Cher Cherokee book out here. And uh, just keeping an eye on Lucy here. Juggling all kinds of things. I'll be right back. I'll let you see the beautiful lake out there. Although I don't care for the, the orange fence that they have there. It's not the best view right right there. But um, but it's still a pretty good view. I'm. It's hard to complain. I'll be right back. Xfinity. Why do I have a fall colored signal instead of a summer colored signal? Green, red and orange, that's all I see. Red and orange, how many drop frames? Oh, what are we up to? Almost 10,000 drop frames. Nice job, Xfinity, nice job.
Okay, I'm back, but I forgot a couple things. I forgot my um, plug-in. I got to plug in because my battery's nearly dead. And I did bring my glasses, but I have I forgot to, the plug-in. So I'll be right back. And then we will get started. Let me put my little socks on since I'm outside. Lucy, where are you? See over here, please. The workers might get a little noisy, which means we might have to switch things up, but hopefully not too noisy. They, um, they're usually not too noisy. Yesterday they did a lot of hammering and pounding, though. Come on, Lucy, up here. Lucy, where are you? Lucy. Lucy. All right, sit down in your basket for me, please. Okay, we are just about ready to get started. How often do I, what do I say, that usually four times before we get started? I don't know. Did you... Wash your face and brush your teeth in the morning. Remember, we have to keep ourselves clean. And in order to keep our teeth clean, we have to brush our teeth twice a day. The thing about brushing our teeth twice a day when we do it first thing in the morning and last thing at nighttime is we just brushed our teeth, the same, right? We don't have any food in our teeth when we do it first thing in the morning. So have your breakfast. Um, some people are like, oh, breakfast is started by the cereal companies. No, breakfast, we, I, if I can trust the research, research says that children need breakfast in order to learn. And uh, that's the reason why schools were forced to start providing breakfast for students. And it was a very good idea. Grades went up considerably. So children cannot learn when they are hungry. And remember, what was it that, I think it was Mifflin Gibbs, in the Mifflin Gibbs book on Hurry Freedom, said that there is no thing that is more far-reaching than nice teeth for a smile, right? So don't forget, if you brush your teeth twice a day, you do a good job, try and do it for two minutes. Brush your teeth for two minutes and do it after breakfast. Don't do it the first thing in the morning, the last thing at night, because then you haven't taken it, you've taken care of your food one time or twice. You've taken care of it twice for uh, the same amount of food, right? So so maybe have do brush your teeth after breakfast. Remember, you shoot for two minutes of brushing teeth. Two minutes. Let me go plug in. Okay, I am still here, and I'm so happy that I am still here teaching, because that is what I was made to do. Even though I didn't know it when I was little, I was talking to some people, a woman whose name was Haley and another one whose name was Marissa, yesterday at the restaurant downtown Milford here, and... Um, I'm not saying the name of the restaurant because I'm not quite sure about the ownership yet. Most of those people there aren't telling me who they are. Like, like Anne. I don't think she's the Anne, but she is a Anne. Who's Mary Ann from Fremont. But that's okay. 
it was delicious and uh, it was a really nice conversation with Haley and with Marissa. I was so happy to talk with them. Um, so we were talking about, oh, I forgot what I was gonna say. Let's get to our book about being a teacher. Lucy, in your basket, come on. About being a teacher and that I didn't really think I was gonna be a teacher because I didn't have a lot of patience and so I suppose being an online teacher is the best is best suited for me. <laughs> All my students love me, didn't you know that? Look it, I can, I can hear them. Yeah, that's the CPA guy I was looking for. A CPA guy, not so much a CPA guy, probably likely a fraud. Likely a fraud. Morris Braveheart, Doug Borman, Kristen Braveheart, Laura Woodward. Near your two houses would be a. Okay, so just let's. We're going to do a review of the pictures in the book, okay? Because we talked all about. Well, we're going to do a review. So here is where the Cherokee Nation lit, resided. Remember, we showed a map of all the different nations, uh, Indian nations, in the United States of America. And there were a lot. And I got to thinking about it. And I just am astounded at how many names. And that would be a great summer boredom buster is to do, I think I said this, find out how many names in your state are American Indian names. Lucy, sit in your basket, come on. How many of them are American Indian names? I know we have Muskegon, we have Pontiac, we have Algonac, we have uh, Charlevoix, we have um, Cadillac, Grand Rapids, I'm almost sure it was in it. I think almost every single town, there was Fremont, I grew up in, I think there was a Fremont tribe, I'm not sure. It seems to me that almost every single name of a town, is that, a, why would we have done that? Why would we have just eliminated all of the American Indians and then named every single, it's like this to me, it's like this. You can't ever forget unless you change every single one of your town's names and even states names, Michigan, Arizona, those are names of Indian tribes. You would have to, it's, it seems to me as if we were somehow forced to name all of those, all of our towns after Indian names and they were like, you won't forget. You can never forget all of your town's names all of them i don't know who are the cherokee so we talked about who are the cherokee we read here is the timeline that they were going to be talking about so this part of the book is all about from 1740 to 1837 so that's kind of nice, gives you an introduction for the timeline. They're not talking about all the time. I think they're talking about now, what kind of story would they have? I don't know. What did you wear? Remember what they were talking about? So turkey feathers that they wore during the winter time and they turned the fur inside so that they stayed nice and warm. Remember that? I do. I just thought that cloak there with turkey feathers was kind of cool. I'm a fashionista, kind of, sort of. Here are more. Who was in your family? There were seven clans, remember? Bird, wolf, deer, wild potato, long hair, blue, and paint. Members of each clan lived in every village. Remember that? How did people get married? They, the bride gave the groom an ear of corn and the groom would send deer meat to the girl's family. Remember that? I didn't. I just reread it. 
How did you get your name? You could have several different names, one that your parents picked, one that you picked, all throughout your life, right? To describe who you are at that point. I certainly wouldn't have been called a teacher. Now I am, right, in my early life, but now I am. Lucy, get over here right now. Lucy, march. Now sit in your basket or I'm gonna put you inside. I said sit in your basket or go inside. Oh, she's, she's, she is not listening to me. I gotta put her inside. She's being very morning curious. <laughs> no. Inside, right now. Yeah, tax accounts, I started asking him questions. He's like, well, you seem dissatisfied, so we're going to drop you, just like Essential Family Chiropractor did, just like uh, somebody else did. We don't like you, so we're going to drop you. Or you you don't seem happy. We're going to drop you. That's the customer service you get right now. What would your house be like? So you would live in two different houses with your large family. One house would be your home in the hot summer months. Your winter home would be nearby. Isn't that awesome? So summer homes and winter homes. I took out the, I thought we were on page 20 and I took out the, so we weren't on, were we still talking about homes? I think we must have been. But let's read this. Your summer home might be made entirely of logs. Or it might be made of small trees and stalks of switchgrass, tall, tall bamboo-like cane grass that grew near the river. Posts cut from trees made the frame of the house and stalks of dry cane were woven between the posts to make the walls. The cane was then covered with a thin layer of mud. The door of your summer house was deer skin that could be pulled back to let in sunlight and cool breezes. There was a roof made of tree bark shingles and a hole to let out smoke from the fireplace that was in the center of the house. Hopefully it won't get too noisy. I might have to move, we'll see. Your bed would be at one end along with your family's beds. The bed frames were made of woven cane, stalk, cane stalks held up by wooden posts. Pine bows or moss were placed under a wo woven grass mat for soft bedding like a mattress. Beaver, otter, beaver, otter, or buffalo skin blankets kept you warm. Your father's weapons would hang from a wall within easy reach should enemies attack. There would be plenty of room in your summer house for you to weave baskets, repair weapons, or make new deerskin clothes. I'm going to move this up a little bit. Near your two homes would be a small cone-shaped building on tall stilt legs. Corn for planting and eating would be stored in this house. The stilt legs would keep rodents and other animals from stealing your family's precious corn. That's pretty cool. It's very similar to the silos that we have now, right? Only our silos are closed up so, so rodents can't get in there. Not at least not very easily. Your house or ossie was round and had a thatched roof made of reeds shaped like a cone. Your ossie had no windows. To enter, you crawled through a small round door. The thick mud walls kept the winter cold out and, and the heat in. That'd be interesting. A fire always burned on the hearth in the center of your winter ho home. Inside the Asi, you would be warm all winter as you listened to stories, mended clothes, or played guessing games. 
your family's household would be one of dozens in the Cherokee village. What was a Cherokee village like? Your village might have 200 or 400, 200 to 400 or more people living in it. The village would be one of the 60 to 80 villages stretching along rivers and the Cherokee County. Look at that great picture there. That's an awesome picture. The rivers gave you fish to eat and fresh water for drinking and bathing. And the cane used to make buildings and many things you needed, such as beds, baskets, and fishing traps. The rivers were also the roads on which you would canoe to visit another Cherokee village. Now it's going to get noisy. That's okay. They got to do their work. It's, you do your work. <laughs> I'll probably go in the back or go inside. I don't want them to have to worry about their work. <laughs> but we do want to see them. <laughs> but we're going to show them on camera because they're hard workers. And we'll kind of go upstairs a little bit. And maybe we'll just take a quick look. But for sure tomorrow... For sure tomorrow we'll take a quick look. Okay, I think I don't want I don't want to bother them and I don't want them to feel like they're bothering me. I'm gonna keep reading though. The council house stood in the center of your village. It was the most important building. In some villages, the council house was built atop a high mound of earth. The council house was made of woven cane covered with a layer of mud, just like your summer home. A sacred fire always burned in the council house. Seven different kinds of wood were used in the fire. The seats behind the fire were for the tribal leaders. The rest of the tribe sat on their separate clan benches. It's good to hear people working, isn't it? It's good to hear work. A big council house could hold more than 400 Cherokee as they watched dances and held meetings or religious ceremonies. So that would be fun, wouldn't it? To have like a party house, sounds like a party house to me. Next to the council house, i.e. party house, was a large open square with seven arbors along the sides, one for each clan. The arbors were made of four posts topped by slanted roof covered by a slanted roof covered with leaves from your arbor the members of your clan could watch the dances games and ceremonies held on the square so so it was like it protected you from the sun right it's like a little it's like a little personal tent that you had there but how many did it say that it held a big council house but could hold more than 400 cherokee the arbors were made of four posts. So just a family. It looks like it just holds just a family there. Lucy. I might have to let her sit. Let me, let me get Lucy here before she falls over from barking like a crazy dog. I said no. I said no. Good girl. Good girl. Sit in your basket, I said. Or you're going to go inside. In your basket. She's doing a good job. 
Sorry you have to see all that on the air. Lucy, you're going to go inside or sit in your, good girl, sit in your basket. She's doing pretty good. I'll probably have to stop in a minute. The summer and winter family houses were built beyond the square, but not far away. According to Cherokee tradition, a home should be close enough for you to hear a drum beaten on the square. Your mother would have a small family garden near your house, but most of the corn you ate was grown in the big village cornfield. The field would be in a valley with rich soil and lots of water. All the women and girls helped take care of this cornfield. The fields and forests surrounding your village were free for anyone to hunt in or explore. Many Cherokee villages had a tall wall of pointed wooden posts surrounding them. This wall helped keep wild animals and enemies out of the village. So, Lucy, sit down. So fellow tribes could be enemies as well, right? So that's that's kind of interesting. I wonder, I wonder, well, I wonder if we're going to read about warring tribes, how they got along with other tribes. We'll see. Who were the village leaders? Each village had two chiefs, one for peace and one for war. How about that? Two chiefs. I did not know that. The white chief or peace chief helped with religious ceremonies. He also made sure people got along. He dressed in white deer skins to show who he was. He was a man known for his bravery and wisdom. He had seven men who helped him rule, one from each clan. The war or red chief, the war chief or red chief, was in charge only in times of war. He wore red clothes. He was selected as war chief because of his skills as a leader and a warrior. He also had seven clan members to help him. A group of war women or beloved women was at every war council. War women had won honors in fighting wars or had warrior sons. The war women helped the Red Chief plan when to attack an enemy. There were other important people in your tribe. The headmen helped the chiefs make decisions, make laws, and conduct religious ceremonies. A priest was also an important religious leader of the tribe. The priest often talked for hours about the correct spiritual way to live. When he finished, everyone said, Tuea. Sound, look, looks almost like Alleluia. Look at it. Look at it. It starts with Yuha or ends with Yuha. To Yuha. Almost looks like right there. Almost looks like at the end, hallelujah. Which means it is true. Verdad. Hallelujah. Yes, it is so. It is true. Verdad. That's Espanol. Lucy? No. Ups Lucy. Upstairs. In your basket. She's so good. I can't believe she's staying up here on the porch. Then she just went down the stair. A woman could not be a chief, but she had the same rights as a man. Look at how much more advanced. We kicked those out of there. We don't want everyone to have the same rights. Out of there, women. Out of there, American Indians. Get out of there. Stop teaching our women they could have rights. What jobs did you do? Everyone helped in whatever way they could. No matter what your age, you helped your family and your village. I probably should go in. I don't want to bother them. I don't want them to think they're bothering me. Hopefully they don't. Okay. 
Everyone helped in whatever way they could. No matter what your age, you helped your family and your village. If you were a girl, you would help the women plant and harvest the village's corn. You would help your mother in your family's garden. Your mother would teach you which mushrooms, berries, and nuts were safe to pick. I don't know that. I saw a mushroom the other day. Who knows? Who knows if you can eat it? I don't. Lucy's sniffing around. Berries. Do you know what berries you can eat? Because bears do. <laughs> Your mother, let's see. You would take care of the tobacco grown for religious ceremonies. You would help build your summer and winter homes. You would cook and make baskets and clay pots and care for younger children. Your days would be very busy indeed as you learn the skills you would need to become a successful mother and the leader of a family. Look at how much respect the women got. No wonder they wanted us out of there, or that us. No wonder they wanted them out of there. We don't respect our women. What are you doing? That's silliness. I like the sounds of men working. <laughs> a boy's day would be busy too as he learned the skills needed to make him a strong Cherokee warrior. Boys would be taught by their mother's brother. Boys would be taught by their mother's brother. Remember what we said. The dad came with no family. The husband came with no family. They came into the mom's family. So boys would be taught by their mother's brother to hunt and fish and to make bows and arrows, arrowheads and blow guns. They would cut down trees for house building. They would help make canoes. So they were busy workers, weren't they? Kind of, kind of like these busy workers over here making some wonderful things. The Cherokee rarely punish their children if they misbehaved. How about that? Uh-oh, time to join the Cherokee Nation. What up with that? They did not spank a child. What? What up? <laughs> children who acted up might be made fun of and teased until they were better behaved. Oh my gosh, how about that? You know what? Children, let me tell you something. Adults could not even stand it. They would rather get whipped than they would be teased. I remember I said that really got me some backbone. Made me be able to laugh at myself because my sisters teased me. Not a lot. My cousins were the ones more that they, our cousins would come over and you couldn't even eat right in front of them. They would look at you like, what are you doing eating? What do you, why do you look so hungry? What's the matter with you looking hungry? <laughs> That's the way it was. Bill Burr, I think, does something on it. He does. He does something on it. But he, he, got, he took it from me because I said that a long time ago. I promise you, I did not steal beer, Bill Burr's work. I do, you know, borrow people's comedy or whatever. Sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. Lucy, in your basket. Good girl. Or they might simply be ignored. Uh-oh, ostracism. That works. No one would talk to them, play with them, or be with them until the punishment was over. Oh my gosh, how about that? It doesn't even occur to us, does it? It doesn't even occur to us. We would be like, what are you doing to that child's self-esteem, the way that you are embarrassing them and shaming them? We have, right? We have, like I had my, I had my boss tell me that a student said I shamed them because I told them that they should try and come to class. Not them personally, the whole class. We can't stand to be shamed. How about that? I think it would work. What time do we have here? 8.37. We're going to keep going. Even with all this noise, we're going to keep going. We'll do our, um, we won't do our bookless classroom outside here though, right? <laughs> let's, let's show the hard workers. Let's show the hard workers. It doesn't look like they mind. They, they got a lot of work accomplished yesterday. 
I'll show you from the top, but they had giant metal beams that they put down and then they put all of those boards and they had to cut all of those boards, they had to measure. So each one of those boards were put in the exact place they were meant to be put in. So somebody went and walked down that entire wall there and measured perfectly for each one of those boards to be put there. So lots and lots of work being done by just a few men. It's nice to see. Okay. Lucy hair. Did you see that all go up? All that Lucy hair go up? What tools would you use? You can hear the tools in the background. Do you suppose that they had electric saws? Do you think they had electric saws? Of course not. Before the new settlers from England and Europe came to America, your tools would have been stones and bones. It goes to show you how hard bones are, right? Pretty hard. Boys would use a sharp rock to smooth wood for bows and arrows. Arrowheads were chipped from a hard stone called flint using the tip of a deer antler. Blow guns were made from cane. They're literally a blow gun right there, right there. And literally, you would, right? You would blow something out of the blow gun like a dart, right? Good for kids. Stone axes were used to cut down trees. Bones and bent sticks made good fish hooks. Interesting. Sticks for a fish hook. Can you imagine? Girls used sharp stones to cut tall cane stalks into long, thin pieces. Lucy, Lucy. They would then strip off the thin outer skin and weave the strips into baskets or mats. The mats used at home or in religious ceremonies were dyed with colors made from berries, nuts, and roots. I bet those were pretty colors, weren't they? I bet they were. The colors in nature are so beautiful. I have something around here growing red berries. Oh, I wanted to show you too. We're gonna show it, we're gonna look at it tomorrow. Look at this. Look at this. See how we can have ADHD, but we make things a little more interesting? It's because I don't have ADHD. Look at each one of these little tiny buds. Each one of them are teeny tiny little buds. Look at that. Teeny tiny little buds that bloom into tiny little flowers that look at Lucy, up here right now. And and we'll see. You can see way back there where there where this is filled with an entire bloom. We'll see more tomorrow. We'll be looking at that more tomorrow. Okay, what did I why did I stop? There was a reason I stopped. It wasn't that. A girl might oh the berries. I was looking at berries, nuts, and roots. A girl also might make her own hoe for the garden by tying a flat stone onto a stick with a strip of leather. They used bone needles for sewing clothes. Look at, look at that. There's a bone hook. There's a bone hook. Lucy. There's probably a knife they made out of a flint. There's an arrowhead. This is an arrowhead right there. That's an arrowhead. Sometimes, a lot of times, people here in Michigan find these arrowheads around. I, I've never found any, but I don't look that hard. There is a deer antler that they use to help sharpen things, right? This is the hoe, H-O-E, not the other hoe. <laughs> so this is the stone that's tied to a stick. And what a hoe does, excuse me, hold on. What a hoe does is it 
turns up the dirt. I'm going to get a hoe out tomorrow when we're doing our science because I have a whole bunch of those plants I said that I don't know if they're weeds or not. They are all over the place and they look horrendous. They look horrible. I keep waiting for a flower to sprout on top and I've got about 7,500 of those big tall weeds with no flower on top. So it's really bothering me a little bit. But we'll, we're going to do that tomorrow. We'll talk about that tomorrow. So there's all, and then, then as we said, this is the blow gun. That's the blow gun, right? So, right? When the new settlers came, the Cherokee stopped using stone and bone tools. Instead, they traded animal skins for sharp steel axes, steel hose, iron cooking kettles, metal fish hooks, and steel sewing needles. So it was kind of nice to trade for those things, wasn't it? And they probably learned something as the new settlers learned about things like planting, where to plant, what to plant, and likely a lot about corn, right? What did you eat? Speaking of corn, there was plenty to eat in Cherokee country and you could eat whenever you were hungry. There were no regular meal times. That makes so much sense, doesn't it? Why eat at a regular time all the time and make it? I'm not even hungry. Oh my gosh, it's a dinner time. Breakfast again. Lunch, what's for lunch? How interesting is that? With our work week, we have to have set meal times, don't we? But they were working here in the Cherokee Nation all the time. How were they working? They were working for one another. They were always working for their families. They were working for one another and always working for their families. How wonderful. Depending on the time of year, you would have plums, grapes, berries, mushrooms, wild greens, persimmons, nuts, and wild potatoes. I wonder what wild potatoes taste like. I wonder if they're gamey. Corn was a favorite meal cooked in soups and stews and ground into meal to make bread. Beans, pumpkins, squash, and sunflower seeds from your garden would also taste good. You could add honey or maple sap boiled into syrup to sweeten your food. How about that? No wonder they spent all their time collecting and gathering, hunting and gathering. That's where they got the names hunter-gatherers. That's what, what they spent all their time doing, hunting and gathering. Meat came from the animals of the forests, meadows, and streams. Deer, bear, elk, buffalo, squirrels, birds, frogs, fish, mussels, and crayfish. How did you hunt and fish? Hunting was the work of men and boys. They used bows and arrows to hunt large game, such as deer. Sometimes they used spears. Blow guns and darts were used to hunt smaller animals, rabbits, groundhogs, squirrels, and birds. Before a Cherokee boy could use a bow and arrow, he first had to prove his skill with a blow gun. Look at that. I said that, wouldn't that be fun for boys to have? Look at, there's the dart. There's the dart. Look at that. And here's, here's our food and in the baskets and put in those beautiful baskets that they made as well. Okay, folks, we are at 847 and I have a little bit of organizing because I put together probably three full PowerPoints for our bookless classroom. And now I have to decide which one I'm gonna be talking about. We have to finish our, our story about President Abraham Lincoln. So we're gonna finish that in our book and our bookless classroom. This is Dr. Annette Farovich. I am the teacher and thank you for joining me on July 25th here 